We are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Medea Benjamin. Medea Benjamin is a former economist and nutritionist with the United Nations and the World Health Organization. She has been an advocate for social justice for more than 40 years and was called one of the highest profile leaders of the peace movement by the Los Angeles Times. She is co-founder of Code Pink and Global Exchange. Her articles appear regularly in outlets such as the Huffington Post, Common Dreams, Alternet, and Op-Ed News. She is the author and editor of eight books, including No Free Lunch, Food and Revolution in Cuba Today, Bridging the Global Gap, a handbook to linking citizens of the first and third worlds, Stop the Next War Now, Effective Responses to Violence and Terrorism, and she is here to talk about her new book, Drone Warfare, Killing by Remote Control. Medea, thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Good morning, Mike. It's good to be here. So uh, start out, tell us the motivation in writing Drone Warfare. I looked at what was happening post 9-11, Mike, and I thought, wow, you know, our government is putting out this idea, and this was under Bush, that we now had these fancy new weapons and that we could target our enemies so precisely that there would be no collateral damage. And I thought, hmm, that doesn't sound right. And I had been, I had started a human rights group called Global Exchange and uh, have a healthy skepticism of all things government and decided to go to the region and see what was happening. This was right after the invasion of Afghanistan. And lo and behold, there were lots of innocent people who had been killed, whose lives were destroyed. And uh, I realized over these last 10 years that this new technology, particularly the drones, was being sold to the American people as a way to make war humanely, and that people were buying it. And I wanted to give people the understanding that these new weapons are not surgically precise. They are not more humane. They're actually making war easier and uh, pulling us into new conflicts that the American people don't even know about. So when you say drones, are you speaking primarily of aerial drones? So drones are aerial vehicles that don't have a pilot in the, in the cockpit. In the case of the ones being used to target and kill people, uh, they are mostly being piloted from the United States, from air bases here or from the CIA headquarters here. So the pilots are in air-conditioned rooms and comfortable chairs, and they're killing people thousands and thousands of miles away that they... Uh, don't know anything about. Um, it's a surreal kind of warfare when you think about it, and it's happening not only in places where we have a more open declared war, like in the case of Afghanistan, but also in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, uh, the Philippines, and the U.S. is opening new bases for drones in other parts of the world, in the Middle East, as well as in Africa. So, and describe what the uh, the various types of drones are, size, and, and what they're armed with. Well, there's all kinds of drones mostly used for surveillance. There's drones the size of insects, uh, birds. Um, there are drones that can be put in the soldier's backpack and launched individually. But I've been focusing on the drones that are the size of either small airplanes or larger airplanes, the Predator and Reaper drones made by General Atomics in Southern California. Um, but uh, drones do come in all shapes and sizes, and they have in common that they are relaying information to whoever is piloting them on the ground. Um, most of them are for surveillance kind of activities, but they can easily be weaponized. That's what happened with the Predator and Reaper drone. They were originally surveillance drones, and then they started strapping weapons onto them. So um, they can be easily converted, and that's one of the reasons uh, I tell people as I travel around with this new book uh, that we better be worried not only about all the blowback from killing people overseas with our drones and spying on countries like Iran that managed to hack into and down a U.S. drone, but also about drones being used right here at home. Okay, so you mentioned uh, Iran hacking into that. I don't think that was ever clear immediately after when that uh, drone was came down. Well, it wasn't clear because the U.S. government was so embarrassed that first they said, wait, wait, that's not even our drone. And then they said, no, no, wait, they didn't hack it down. Somehow we brought it down. <laughs> and it uh, turns out that indeed uh, the Iranians had hacked into it and 
brought down a very sophisticated drone that is um, that that first they thanked President Obama for, and then they reversed engineered it, and they've been producing their own. And not only that, they starting a factory in Venezuela to produce drones as well. But that's just one example. There are so many drones, Mike, that are being sold on the open market by the U.S., but mostly by Israel that has no restrictions on selling their drones overseas. So they're selling them to about 50 different countries around the world. And now the Chinese have gotten into the act as well. So anybody who thought, okay, you know, the U.S. can get away with this because we're so powerful and we're the ones who have the drones should think twice. And they're also slated to be used in this country here very soon. I mean, they're, they're already cleared the way for it. Well, your Seattle Police Department is one of the testing sites for drones in the hands of the police. And I think the people of Seattle should be horrified that uh, your police department is being militarized to the extent that you have your own drones and that this is part of an experiment that's being pushed by the drone manufacturers to say, hey, wouldn't it be lovely if all 18,000 police stations in the United States had their own drones? So the Federal Aviation Administration has been giving out some testing permits to about 30 police stations, including the one here in Seattle. And uh, if uh, now there is new legislation that says by September 2015, the U.S. airspace has to be opened up to drones entirely, which means that if we don't do something about it, all of those police stations are going to have drones. And as I said, uh, while they've been touted for things like search and rescue missions, they can be weaponized and they can also have all kinds of uh, techniques for uh, spying in, uh, on citizens, and that includes facial recognition, thermal imaging, cracking into your Wi-Fi and uh, text messages. And, of course, when you think about who is going to be surveilled here in the United States, uh, it's immigrant communities, it's Occupy folks, it's protesters, it's African-American communities, Muslim community, uh, which is one of the reasons why we're creating a pretty broad-based coalition now in not only those communities, but people who consider themselves libertarians, Ron Paul supporters, even some neocons like uh, Charles Krautheimer or uh, Judge Napolitano has got a show on Fox TV are saying, keep those drones out of U.S. airspace. Well, that'll be quite the uh, battle. So talk a bit more about uh, the drones themselves, uh, the ones we're using in other countries currently. Where do they fly out of? Where the, what are the bases that they are based in? They can be based just about anywhere, which is what makes this technology pretty remarkable. Uh, uh, for example, the drones being flown in Afghanistan are being piloted from Air Force bases like Creech Air Force Base outside of Las Vegas. Uh, drones being flown in Pakistan are being uh, piloted at, uh, outside the CIA in Virginia. And there are drone bases that are being set up in the region as well. They need a local a, a base near uh, where they're being used to launch them from and maintain them. Uh, but they can be piloted basically anywhere in the world. And some of these drones can fly for extended periods of time. Is that correct? Yes, that's the, quote, beauty of these drones. They can be up in the air for uh, long periods of time. They hover over villages. They terrify local populations. Uh, when they fly low, they have a buzzing sound that there are now words for in local languages that is called the sound of death because uh, people never know when they're going to launch one of these Hellfire missiles and who's going to be killed during the night. Uh, that's uh, uh, happening in places like northern Pakistan, where under the Obama administration, these have become the weapon of choice. So much so that by 2011, the U.S., uh, well, the CIA was launching one drone strike every three days. Now it's down to one every four days. But thousands have been, people have been killed in Pakistan alone. Uh, there are not journalists allowed into the region. So we have to collect this information from a variety of sources. But it seems like uh, over 175 children have been killed. And according to the administration, Mike, and this is something that's pretty mind-blowing, the, they, they define any male of military age who is in the area where we are using these drones as militants. They don't have to commit any crime. They don't have to be charged. They don't have to be proven guilty of anything. Uh, just by virtue of, of the fact that they are men in these areas, uh, they are considered fair game. 
and the CIA and now the Joint Special Operations Commander, JSOC of the military, have the authority in Pakistan and Yemen to kill people who are not only on a hit list, who have been identified by name, but also to kill people on the basis of suspicious activity. So there are a lot of innocent people who are being killed by these, quote, surgically precise drone strikes. Wouldn't most living males fall within that range of being a uh, potential militant? Well, that's right. And also, when you're talking about places like Yemen and northern Pakistan, if you identify people further as having uh, beards and turbans and carrying guns, you're talking about most of the men as well. And so that's why your listeners, when they hear, like we heard just on Saturday uh, last week, oh, 12 militants killed, 10 militants killed, whatever the number, you got to think, well, who are these people? And the other thing, Mike, is that by uh, the authority of that the U.S. claims to have is that they are killing people who are about to kill us. Most of these people have no possibility of killing Americans. Uh, they might have joined the local Taliban out of uh, poverty, out of desperation, out of wanting some stability in their region, out of uh, religious beliefs, uh, but not because they wanted to act, attack Americans. Now, of course, the the more we use these drones, the more we uh, get people angry at us, the more people then do want to join a militant group and try to find a way to get back into Afghanistan, for example, to kill, kill American soldiers. Um, but when you think about how circuitous this whole thing is, we are killing people who we think might want to someday kill us, and once we kill them, their families, their tribe, their neighbors uh, do want to kill us. So it really is a, a state of perpetual war that only benefits the producers of these weapons. You talked about uh, President Obama and the, the kill lists. Could you talk about that some more? Because my understanding is they have regular weekly meetings now to discuss this. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable when you think about uh, they have something that they call Terror Tuesdays, where they meet on Tuesdays. They look through information that is uh, resembles baseball cards, and they come up with a kill list. So they decide who is going to live and who is going to die. Uh, they play the prosecutor, judge, jury, executioner all at once. And President Obama is intimately involved in this. In fact, some of this information was leaked to the New York Times and other press as part of a campaign strategy to show any independents or any people who still might think after all these years that President Obama is a bit of a wuss when it comes to uh, killing, uh, that this should convince them that he is indeed a tough guy. Uh, but I think it has really shocked a lot of people because I see having completed the book uh, at a time when there wasn't a lot of talk about drones, there suddenly is a lot of talk about drones, and a lot of people are coming out to my talks because they are horrified at the idea of the president um, playing this kind of role, uh, really the role of God, and saying um, that he has the right, the ability, uh, and he does it uh, with ease, deciding who is going to live and who is going to die, and even has put Americans on kill lists. Um, you know, the drones don't give anybody a chance to surrender. By international law, you're supposed to be able to surrender. And one would think that here in the U.S. that we had the right to a judicial process, that uh, you couldn't just be executed by your own government without that process. But lo and behold, uh, it seems that Americans don't have that right, and American people have been killed, including a 16-year-old Denver-born boy killed by a drone strike in Yemen. So President Obama has firsthand knowledge of the people that are being killed. Is that correct? He signs off on the kill list in uh, Yemen and in uh, Somalia and for most of that kill list in, uh, in, in Pakistan as well. So, yes. And uh, he doesn't sign off on the kill list of suspicious behavior because that's a much more broad category. But he is the one who really... Uh, comes up in the end with this kill list. And we have not declared war on any of those three countries. Is that correct? Well, that's a good comment to make because indeed we haven't. And one of the things that terrifies me about the drones is that the uh, Obama administration has now claimed the right as the executive branch to decide when to use violence, when to have the U.S. engage in conflicts, 
without the Congress even having a chance to discuss it. So Congress has not talked about uh, making war in, in Pakistan or Yemen and Somalia. Congress didn't even have a say when the U.S. got involved militarily in Libya because the administration says, well, when you're only using drones, no American lives are at risk. Why this doesn't uh, enter into the War Powers Act that Congress has? So it's a uh, amazing usurpation of power on the uh, behalf of the executive branch. And whether or not somebody likes the Obama administration and might be able to forgive them for all of these drone strikes, think about the next president, the next president, and how they are going to use this newfound power that the Obama administration has taken. Are there any members of Congress that are objecting to this uh, policy? There are members of Congress on the left and the right, like Dennis Kucinich. The problem is uh, they haven't been able to move the vast majority of Congress people on this. When Dennis Kucinich introduced a letter to President Obama that didn't say uh, what I would have liked it to say, which is, stop the kills, uh, ground the drones. This is, you know, disgusting behavior and, and we won't have it anymore. It simply said, um, could you be a little transparent and accountable about way, the way that you, you were using these? He only got 25 other Congress people to sign on to him. That's about a third of the Progressive Caucus. So uh, it seems like in an election year, it's very difficult to get Democrats to criticize President Obama and uh, folks on the right, well, they love this killing. You know, they, they, they'd probably go for it even more whole hog than the Obama administration is. Uh, do you have a sense for how many congressional districts have production facilities for drones in them? Well, that's another very good question. And since most of this information is secretive, we don't. Uh, we know that every major uh, weapons manufacturer, including Boeing and Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, General Atomics, General Dynamics, they all are involved in drone production. Leon Panetta, the Secretary of Defense, had said it's the only game in town. This is the future of warfare. So they all want a piece of the pie, whether they're making the entire drone or pieces for the drone or uh, new kinds of missiles to attach to the drone or the cameras. Um, they're all involved in this. And not only these companies, but uh, a lot of universities, and especially state universities. We're starting to get some of this information through Freedom of Information Act requests. But um, it's pretty much guaranteed that in every state there is a lot of involvement through think tanks, universities, uh, scientific centers, research centers, uh, and manufacturers uh, in drone production. And in fact, I, I know that in the uh, recent documents that the Electronic Frontier Foundation was key in uh, getting out, that uh, universities were key in uh, getting licenses to fly drones. Well, that's right. And uh, this is something that we should be very concerned about. And in the fall, we're going to do a campaign on campuses to have the students first uh, demand that this information be made public, who is working with the military on this and what is the nature of the project. And if indeed the students then determine that this is something they think is immoral uh, to try to sever those ties. And there's also the issue of student uh, money being invested in companies that are producing these weapons. So we're anxious to be working with students like we already are with Johns Hopkins uh, that has a lot of ties with uh, the military on this and other kinds of weapons production. Uh, you were talking about that uh, these drones that are being used in places like Afghanistan, Pakistan are being flown or controlled here in the U.S. Um, how many people are involved with keeping a drone uh, up in the air? Well, another good question. Um, it, it, it's counterintuitive, Mike. You would think that because there's no pilot in the cockpit, you're actually saving on labor. But there's an immense number of people who are involved in keeping these drones up in the air. It's estimated that for one of these killer drones, uh, to keep it up for a day takes about 160 people. Uh, and a lot of that is the people who are required to look at all the images that are coming out on the screens uh, to pour through this data. Uh, there are big, big drones like the Global Hawk that are these huge surveillance drones the size of a commercial airliner. And they produce thousands of hours of images that have to be gone through. And um, 
So between the maintenance, it's estimated that the drones on the border, for example, they require one hour of maintenance for every hour in the air. And because these drones are in the air for long periods of time, uh, they are a lot more expensive to run than has been told to the American public because that's one of the, quote, advantages that um, we've been told that these are cheap, that you can buy drones for $10 million, uh, $20 million, and you can buy drones for the police force for a couple of hundred thousand dollars. But when you look at the maintenance cost and also the fact that a lot of these crash, many of them crash, the technology is really not there yet. And that's why the FAA has been reluctant to permit a lot of drones flying in our airspace because they know how often they crash. Uh, but you put all these factors together, they are very labor intensive and they're actually quite expensive. I think I'd read that uh, at least one of those drones that uh, they have so many cameras on them now, it's like in the hundreds for some of them. Is that right? Well, yes. And you look at the, the, the large uh, Global Hawk, it's got tremendous numbers of cameras and incredible technology that is used for uh, the sensors and the imaging. Um, so, yes, there's all kinds of drones with all different levels of sophistication. Uh, but the, uh, as I, I said earlier, they are proliferating in great numbers. And um, it is not only uh, our friends and allies overseas, but uh, all kinds of countries and non-state entities who now have their own drones. And I believe I'd also read that uh, the Air Force now is training more drone pilots than uh, for uh, drones than for standard aircraft. Yes, that's an old-fashioned thing now to be a pilot in the aircraft. The, the new pilots are almost all being trained now to be drone pilots, uh, something that was very difficult for the old-fashioned pilots to agree to. Um, there was a lot of resistance, particularly in the Air Force, to the drones, uh, but now that enough time has passed, they realize, as uh, Panetta said, this is the only game in town, and um, there's not much to do about it. But it, we do want to reach out to pilots that are piloting commercial aircraft in the United States and pilots for companies uh, like Messenger Services because uh, those companies would like to have their fleets all be transformed into pilotless or uh, drone kinds of uh, aircraft, and this would be devastating to the pilots association. So um, we were talking about Congress previously. I understand there's also like a drone caucus or something like that? Indeed there is. Who would have thought that 58 members of Congress, including Democrats and Republicans, would think that one of the primary purposes for their being elected by We the People was to uh, promote the drone industry uh, to address what they call the urgent need for the use of more uh, unmanned aerial vehicles for uh, not only overseas but for domestic use as well. So these legislators have passed new legislation opening up our airspace. Uh, they are pushing for any restrictions on drone sales overseas to be removed, and they are doing the bidding of this now very powerful drone industry. And do you anticipate that uh, drones will be making it into uh, uh, private ownership? I mean, is, is Code Pink going to eventually be buying a drone? <laughs> well, we actually do have a drone. You know, there are these uh, very small drones that you can buy. Uh, you can even buy them from your good old Amazon.com. Uh, for about 300 or 350 bucks, you too can have your own drone. Uh, I must say they are very flimsy. They break all the time, so then you got to go out and buy the spare parts to them. And there are many people in the Occupy movement who thought, oh, cool, you know, let's have our own drones. We can fly them over the heads of the police and see what they're doing and uh, have it on camera when they use excessive force. Uh, that's all well and good, but what is really driving this industry is uh, the military uh, homeland Security, the uh, law enforcement agencies, and as uh, permits are handed out, we can guess who is going to get the permits. Um, yes, there are going to be commercial drones, and some of them might have very good uses. In fact, there are uh, good uses for drones now. There are fire departments that have drones and say that they can use them to pinpoint where the fire is coming from. Uh, when you have large forested areas or uh, environmental groups that say that it, they are using drones on the high seas to detect where illegal whalers are. 
Um, so there are some positive uses for drones, but the uh, we have to really think about where is the impetus of the uh, drone movement coming from, and where will the uh, the biggest, baddest drones be? Um, they are not <clears throat> only going to be law enforcement agencies and the military, um, but they will be corporations. And corporations using having their own fleet of drones is a very frightening thing to uh, to many people. And already we see oil companies like Chevron having drones to protect their resources from the local people. Wow. Like the way they protected their resources in Nigeria? That's right. And that's exactly where they have drones in Nigeria. Let's talk about things we can, as citizens can do. You talked previously about your efforts this coming fall on campuses. What else do you see as uh, potential ways to uh, address this? Mike, we have a lot of campaigns, and as I travel around, I'm learning more things that people think we should do. So, for example, at the local level, we're asking people to meet with their police department or make a simple phone call. And in the Seattle area, this is absolutely uh, critical to do. Ask, uh, what are these drones that you have? Uh, have they been used? What are they being used for? Why do you think they need them? In a time of austerity, uh, what is this costing us, the taxpayers? And um, where'd you get the money for it? And uh, then I think add something like, we don't think you need those drones. Um, that's, uh, we're also asking uh, communities to pass no drone resolutions to say they don't want these drones to be used to invade their privacy. We're working with Congress people from the progressives to uh, Rand Paul to say that drones cannot be used to invade our, our, our privacy without a warrant. Uh, and that government agencies shouldn't give out grants to local police departments to buy drones. Uh, then on uh, some of the other international levels, we're meeting with and pressuring the intelligence uh, oversight committees in U.S. Congress to try to get the drones out of the hands of the CIA. We are taking a delegation to Pakistan in the fall, in September 21st to 28, to do a peace march with the people of Pakistan in the areas of northern Pakistan, Waziristan, where the drones are killing so many innocent people. We're very excited about it. We're, we're meeting in Islamabad on International Peace Day, September 21st, and inviting people of the public to join us. All this information is on two websites. One is called droneswatch.org. That's plural, droneswatch.org. And the other is codepink.org. Uh, and you can find out about uh, the trip to Pakistan, you can sign up to uh, tell the um, uh, the Congress to do its job and get drones out of the hands of the CIA. You can put a, your own personal message to the U.S. ambassador in Pakistan, who now signs off on death warrants, uh, these drone strikes, and say, uh, hey, you're supposed to be a diplomat, use negotiations and peace talks and not uh, these death machines, and we will hand deliver it to the uh, ambassador when the, we are there. So these are some of the campaigns. And uh, another one is to reach out to the faith-based community. We are reaching out to reverends, priests, imams, rabbis, and say, this is a critical moral issue of our times. You should be speaking out about it. Here's a statement that we would like you to sign on to. And that statement you can find on those websites as well. So that's some of the outreach and some of the campaigns we're involved in. We are speaking with Medea Benjamin. She is co-founder of Code Pink and Global Exchange and author of the new book, Drone Warfare, Killing by Remote Control. And you are speaking tonight here in Seattle at uh, 7 p.m. at Elliott Bay Books. And so I'm sure people are going to have a lot more questions for you and that would be a good forum to uh, to do that? Well, that would, and it would be also a wonderful forum to buy this book, which I think is a, a pretty critical tool for people to have because, uh, Mike, I don't know if you've seen any of these statistics, but it seems like the overwhelming majority of Americans think these drones are a good thing. And that's our colleagues, our relatives, our uh, um, uh, you know people that we... Uh, interact with on a regular basis, we've got to convince them that these drones are not a good thing. And this book will give people the tools they need for uh, winning those arguments. And also, the last two chapters are all about what are people doing, uh, both on the local, the national, and the international level, like at the UN. And uh, hopefully, we'll inspire people to 
uh, support some of these actions. So I hope people come tonight, get a copy of the book, and also uh, discuss some of these issues and give us some new ideas for campaigns. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Thanks for having me on, Mike.